So, question to uh, kick us off. Best party you've ever been to is three, two, one. Uh, who was there? What was there? And why was it the best party? So let's just give you a second to think through that. Best party you've ever been to, who was there? What was there? Like what was going on? Why was it the best party uh, you've ever been to? I would have to say the best party I've ever been to was my wedding reception. Um, and uh, my wife was there. She was like, you know, like, you know how two people get married, but it's really the bride's thing. It's like, it's like her thing and, and the groom and everybody kind of just gets to go along. And um, so Shane, I know that's happening to you soon. Just, that's a good little marriage tip, okay? It's, it's her thing and you just support that and, and honor that. It's awesome. It's really awesome to honor and see my wife as like the center of that party. And all my family was there and we had lots of like feasting and it was just like this really amazing, moment. That's part. As I think about um, Palm Sunday and Jesus um, historically riding into Jerusalem on uh, that animal which actually signified prophetically, like in the Old Testament, that the king was entering, that there, there was a new king in town. Um, as I think about that, the people, they're waving their branches, you know, if you're kind of familiar with the story, and they're saying, Hosanna, son of David, which means like, save us, and um, not everybody knew exactly what that meant, right? Like, they were just part of the celebration of what was going on. That might be some of you here today. You, don't, you didn't understand what was happening during the worship, you just knew that something cool was happening. That's okay. You just kind of join in as, as, as you can best understand it and stick around. That would be my encouragement, just stick around and let God keep making things clear to you. But especially in that first Palm Sunday, it was, it was as if, even though everybody didn't understand the fullness of what was happening, they knew that there was a better party in town. They knew that somehow Jesus was like hosting and at the center of this better party that had come to town and they wanted to be a part of it. So I think of best parties, things like that. Um, when I start to think about evangelism, it seems as though it would be a really healthy shift in some of our minds, and maybe you're there, but it would be a really healthy shift for us to think about inviting people to the better party. And guess what? Jesus is at the center. The better party. As, as we're working through this idea here in our series, we're in the All In series, and we're, we're getting towards the end of it. And the last couple of weeks is going to be all about reimagining evangelism. Uh, and what we're saying here is uh, we would love to see, we believe God has called us to radical gospel renewal for Delray and beyond. But in order for us to get there, there are a few things that we have to become more proficient in. Uh, one of them was uh, instances God. We actually just had a workshop last Friday about like prayer and, and how to do that and how to grow intimacy there. And, and so we're trying to equip you with how to grow more intimate with God because we don't think radical gospel renewal will happen unless it first happens to your hearts. And so we're trying to help you with that so that together we can see this new vision come alive. And we also talked about family life and we know that we have to do it together as you just saw rather than just individually. We also spent a couple weeks on living generously. And we're saying, hey, in order to see this, this picture of what God gives us in Revelation, the, the new heavens and the new earth, in order to see more and more of that come today, we're going to have to learn to live generously. And so the last segment, if you will, in this All In series is reimagining evangelism. Reimagining what it might be like to pursue those who are lost and far from God around us and invite them into a living and loving relationship with the guide you serve today. So in order to do that, we would first have to kind of give a definition for evangelism. And so I, you know, I'm not necessarily changing it, I'm just asking you to use a little bit of your holy imagination. Do you know that you have imaginations that if, if God's spirit lived within you, you're allowed to use and you're allowed to ask God to give you some divine imagination? Like give me some divine vision for maybe what's not yet here. How could things be a little bit different? So I'm going to ask you over the next couple of weeks, hey, let's broaden our horizons. I'm not taking away from the definition I'm about to give you, but let's broaden our horizons. Uh, and so this is how the Oxford Living Dictionary defines evangelism. The spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. 
pretty straightforward. And, and so you might have, as you think about like evangelists and things like that, maybe somebody like Jesus pops into your mind. Always a good start, right? Always a good start. And, and, and did he publicly preach and personally witness to the Christian gospel, to the Christian message that people who are broken and far from God can be called sons and daughters through his death and resurrection? Did he preach that? Of course. Yes. Was he a personal witness to it? Yes. Did his life reflect it? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so then maybe we go to the apostles and the early church. Maybe even those of you who were part of the St. Patrick's Day Parade and helped us out there. We know the story of Patrick and his evangelical fervor for a country that had enslaved him. Uh, maybe even if you go to uh, 1880 through, uh, let's see, just checking my ears here. Well, at least the beginning, around 1880, was known as the era of the evangelist. And you have, anybody heard of a guy named Dwight L. Moody? Okay, a couple of Dwight L. Moody's. Uh, what about this other guy, Billy Graham? Billy, Billy Graham? Okay, great. I see, I'm reminded of our online audience, guys. Well, you can raise your hand when I ask questions, even if those around you don't know what you're doing. Go ahead and participate with us. Um, So the idea that God has called his people to make disciples, is, is that's nothing new. That's a, that's a Matthew 28 command that Jesus gives us. But, but potentially, some of the ways that we go about that need to be reimagined and contextualized for different cultures and different times. That doesn't mean the message changes. Like, we're sinners. We will die and go to hell without a savior named Jesus. And the way that Jesus paid for you to be made right with God was on a cross by being crushed for your sin and mine. And on the third day, being resurrected from that death, overcoming your sin and my sin, and then giving us the opportunity to turn from self and believe and receive him as savior and master. That message doesn't change. That's always this is the message that Jesus preached. It's actually the message that the Old Testament looked forward to. It's the one that Jesus fulfills. The early church was built on that. And then Christianity has spread. That's how you become a disciple, by understanding and allowing God to make that message a reality in your life. The message is still the same. But is it true, and can we not particularly reimagine what that might look like today as opposed to 1880, or maybe even when St. Patrick was walking around doing his thing? I think the answer is yes. And, and so um, we, we've seen, uh, if you're familiar with, with the sort of the Billy Graham movement, I would say he's probably the most recognizable evangelist. Uh, the way that that worked was he was this awesome, dynamic, anointed speaker, and he would come and he would have a, what was it called? Okay, he would have a crusade. Probably not an amazingly popular word today anymore, right? I mean, if we're going to talk about context and reimagine, he, but, but, but back then, it was super cool. And people, what they would do is they would invite their friends to come to this big crusade in like a big stadium. He would share the gospel. He would call people forward and a ton of people would get saved. Like that's, that's just what was happening. Okay, and that's awesome. Like, thank you, Lord, for that. There was also an era of, of they may know who Bill Bright is. Yes. Okay, the four spiritual laws where guys, and men and women, they would hand out tracts. And people would greet a tract and then they, they would make a decision to follow Jesus like it would make sense of it. And so there was an error for that. And I'm not saying those things don't still happen and aren't still effective. Like I know there's a guy, I'm sorry, I can't remember his full name. I think his first name is Nick. He comes to Calvary Chapel and like a ton of people get saved. So he's kind of like a speaker that goes on tour and that's still, so I'm not downplaying that. I'm just saying, hey, if that is your definition of evangelism, then that probably leaves you very little room to play yourself. It sort of makes you like a secondary bystander, hoping people go to the big event, rather than somebody that God may want to use personally in somebody's life. So we just want to broaden your definition of evangelism. So let's go ahead and take a look at the, at the definition that we're working with here over the next couple of weeks, reimagining evangelism. Here, here we go, becoming relationally relevant Let's just start there. Becoming, it's on your outline. You should have received the outline. There'll be some blanks for you to fill in just a second if, you, if you're a blank filler outer. If you're, if you're not, don't judge me for giving the blanks. Some people like that. 
okay? So you just don't have to do it. There's no condemnation here. So uh, becoming relationally relevant. Maybe that's because I'm not a blank fellow. Okay. Hmm. Sometimes I digress. Relationally relevant. So what if, what if one of the first moves of an evangelist today, what if one of the first moves of us as a church, if we wanted to see radical gospel renewal, would be to become more relationally relevant to those who don't yet know Jesus as Savior? I mean, what, what, if, what if we, we needed to spend a bit more time understanding the thought pattern, the life, the wants, and the desires of those who are far from the living God before we actually took the message of the living God to them? Would that not be loving? Would that not be a, a, an evangelical, let's just use a word, revival, that our city would certainly be blessed by? Becoming relationally relevant in the loving, both demonstration and declaration of the gospel. So let me say from the up, upstart, you're going to hear some things as I, as I work through some, some like practical outworkings of this, where you might think, oh, well, you're not, you're not declaring the gospel. You're not, you, you didn't actually say, Jesus dead, resurrected, you repent, believe. Let me be clear. That as we reimagine evangelism, it is both the demonstrated life of the living Jesus within you and the proclamation of that and the declaration of it. So it's both and. It's just that in every single situation, both and do not have to occur for evangelism to be taking place. Are, are you with me on that? Some of you, that might be a new, that might be a new paradigm for you. Because you might be thinking, unless I'm giving an altar call in my living room, I am not being evangelistic. And what I want to challenge us with is broadening our definition of what it means to be evangelistic. Because although many of you probably responded, potentially, in a church service like this to a call to come follow Jesus, there was a long list of evangelical people that God had divinely put in your path in order to get you here. Are you with me on that? It's important that you stay with me on this because I don't want you to check out and start to divide things between like secular and sacred. Like what Casey does is secular because he's going to share the gospel. But what I do Monday through Friday, that's just kind of secular because I don't ever get to say the name Jesus. You're wrong if that's how you think. And I don't want to condemn you. I want to encourage you. And so that's what we're going to be working through here over the next couple of weeks. So where do we start? Well, let's go to Luke 15. And uh, in Luke 15, we're going to find a, a very familiar, could be familiar story. It depends if you're new here. I love the fact that if you've never heard of Luke, or, and especially then Luke 15, I, I love that because that means you're new to the whole thing. And, and that means that the Lord's doing a really sweet work. And so if you're familiar with it, cool. That's awesome too. But if, if Luke is new to you and you're like, Bible, what are you talking about? Awesome, you're in a great place. You're in a great, safe place to stay and explore what God might be doing in your heart. And so Luke, he's a doctor, and he wrote this whole story about Jesus from a historical perspective. And um, he just, he, he took down accounts and teachings and activities of Jesus. And Luke 15 is one of the more famous ones, because you might know it as the prodigal son, or the lost son, which... Uh, as in preparation for this, you, you may hear some influence, you will hear some influence from a book that I reread called Prophet God by Tim Keller. Uh, it's a great small read. I can't recommend it highly enough. Tim Keller, Prodigal of God. Um, and, and in that, there, he kind of challenges the title of this parable. He wouldn't necessarily call it the, the prodigal uh, son, but he would call it the prodigal God. Because the word prodigal means reckless and like, like fully abandoned. And so many people think that it's the son who was reckless and fully abandoned to his, his wayward life, but it's actually God who's reckless and fully abandoned to his love for both his sons. Amen. The context for this parable comes from Luke 15, verses 1 through 3. That will be on the screen behind me. And then I'm going to read you the parable, and as I read you the parable, I'm going to kind of shift places 
uh, for you, because it's not going to be up there. I'm going to want you to either follow in your scriptures or just kind of follow along in your mind. And as I move around the auditorium, it's kind of a shifting scene. So that'll kind of help you uh, keep track of the parable, because it's a bit of a longer parable. Here's the context. Uh, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, that's Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, that's what they, they, they did that best. If you're a grumbler, that's a good sign you might be in, in one of these categories. And this is what they were grumbling about. This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And he goes on and he tells them a few parables, and most of the parables are about lost stuff, and this one is as well. So the context is that Jesus is addressing sort of the hardness of heart that religious people have toward his acceptance of, what is it, sinners in other places, tax collectors are thrown in there, sort of the worst of the worst, that, that God would make hospitable room for people like me. Religious people don't like that. So then he goes down to uh, verse 11, and he tells this parable. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, please give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his prosperity in reckless living. Verse 14, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And while he was there feeding the pigs, he had a longing to be fed with their pods, that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to the father, my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shears on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked them what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to his son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Amen. Amen. So as we look at this particular parable, which is a story that Jesus tells in order to teach a, a, a greater truth, we're able to see a couple of key uh, characters in the, in the narrative that are important to us as we, as we work our way through it. And the first one is there's, uh, a, there's one kind of dad, okay? Important. There's, there's one kind of dad, there's two kinds of lost, and there's three kinds of responses in this particular, uh, in this particular passage. And so we, we get to see in verse 3 early in Luke, Luke 15 that Jesus is going to say, basically, you've got the wrong idea of who you think God is. Yes. You need to reimagine the Father. And so he encourages, and even in a spirit of like encouragement, but also some rebuke, like, listen, if you stay with this understanding of the Father, you will perish. This is far from life. This is not who my dad is. There's one kind of dad, and you haven't figured out who he is. And so this parable is to help explore the heart of the Father of Jesus. Now that might be difficult for some of you to hear based on your relationship with your dad. When I start talking about one kind of dad, those are not good memories for you. And I just want to, I want to value that and tell you that I'm sorry for whatever wounding a man of God did to you. And I say man of God because he was the man that God had put in your life where he should have brought healing and hope. I'm sorry for that. We value that and that there's no quick fix to it. But whether you have that type of dad, or the type of dad that was awesome, but you, you, you said, hey, there's some things that I'm going to do different than my dad did, even though it was like a really great experience. No matter what kind of dad you had, this is the dad of all dads. This is the dad that heals those wounds of that first one that are still with you this morning. This is also the dad that you don't have to elevate or get better at. This is the dad that you can finally rest and receive. There's one kind of dad in this story. Now, there's two kinds of lost. Keller does a great job in his book of, of bringing this out. There's two types of lost people. A lot of times we like to sentimentalize. I, that's totally not a word, is it? I, I don't know what it is, but make sentimental the first son. We like to say, like, oh my goodness, I'm so awesome the first time. And sometimes, even when I was reading the passage, uh, there were some of you that might have thought I was going to stop there. When, when the first son comes home and, and there's this kind of like really sweet opportunity for us to talk about the graciousness of the Father. And if you're here and you bring in baggage that you would never want to share with even your closest confidant, I mean, it's sexual in nature, it's destructive in nature. It's repetitive in nature, it's embarrassing, it's illegal, whatever it is, man. Like, this is the dad for you. This is the dad that has your name. Desires you. Pursues you. He's got your name on his heart and he's coming after you this morning. I'm praying. Yes, yes. So understand that if you came in here ashamed and condemned and guilty because of what happened the last 15 years or the last 15 minutes before you walked in this building, my dad is the one for you. Yes, 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 yes. My dad is also the one for those of you who live a much more polished, sinful life that looks a lot socially more acceptable but on the inside, you still have different details, but the same emotion. Yeah. My, my dad's the one for you, too. You know, those of you who are angry or resentful or, or judgmental or you, like you carry that stuff and you know you shouldn't and, and, you, and, and like there's, you actually become aware of some of your stuff and, and, and you, it's just very hard for you to be around other people because you're right and they're wrong, even when they might be right, you still right somewhere deep in your heart and, and you actually hate it. You actually don't like living like that. You actually, if you were honest, would do anything you could 
to leave your older brother mentality, but you can't, and you're still stuck in the fields, slaving for God, reading your Bible, fasting, praying, doing everything you should, far from a living God. My dad's for you too. You can come too. But you have to come. You gotta come. And so as we see here in the story, there's three kinds of responses. This is where we fill out blanks. If you're into that, doesn't make you an older brother, by the way, but it just makes you organized, maybe. Three kinds of blanks. Hey, so in the first blank, we, we, see, the, we see the response of the, el- of the younger son, and, and we see that he says, basically, in Luke 15, 19, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's called humility, and you're going to see an I blank. So basically what the younger son is saying is, I quit. I quit. What we're going to see the older son saying in, in verse 28 is, uh, well, it says that in verse 28, it says, but he was angry. He was angry when he began to see the graciousness of the father. And so basically what he was expressing was pride. And, and what he was saying with his heart is, I deserve. And then we see the father's response. And we see the father's response. Um, it, 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 that's, that's in verse 31 where he says, son, you are with me and all the time is yours. So like you can come, but it's also fitting because this guy was dead. And now he's alive. And grace has, has awoken his heart. And so we really see the father saying, I desire. I desire. I quit. I deserve. I desire. I was thinking through this um, as, as it pertains to this particular passage, and it's like, this is so not good parenting. Like, I don't think of many situations where I encourage my kids to quit. No matter how bad it gets, it's like, we're Cleveland's bro, we stick it out. Like, that's what we do, not a quitter. Now get back in there and keep suffering. It's good for you, you know? It'll make character. And stuff. And so, you know, like that's, that, that's, and then, and then people come around and they're like, that's good. That's good. Don't let them quit. Don't let them out of a hard situation. And, and I'm not saying that we stop it. I'm just saying let's recognize that the most important move we can make is very anti cultural to basically everything America and even the world today says is awesome. Come on. The gospel says you can't have it until you quit on yourself. You stay out in the field or with the pigs until you come to the end of yourself, like the younger son did, and just say, like, I'm quitting on me. There's got to be something better. We call that, we call it fancy words like surrender or give your life to Jesus or come to the end of yourself. And that's all all cool stuff. Basically, we just need to get better at quitting on ourselves earlier if we want to get to the better part. And as we think about that evangelistically, Simply, that is just the opportunity to invite somebody who's at a lesser party to quit where they are and begin to walk with you to that better party. One of the ways that, you know, I've, I've been thinking about how do I express this to my kids and how does this become a, a reality to them and just kind of like, you know, we, we set the culture in our homes and, and so one of the, this is a simple application to this and maybe it doesn't connect with you, but in, in most mornings when my kids leave the house or I drop my kids off, one of my daughters is driving out well, the other one's two, so that would be weird. But the 16 year old's driving, and I can say that I have two daughters now because um, last Wednesday I was able to adopt our two foster children, and now they're kids. <laughs> So we brought them to the better party. So now we're all Cleveland's, and it's awesome. And I say I adopted, we adopted, and I uh, helped my wife to adopt. However, you have that like, wording is best. That, that's kind of, and speaking of adoption, I believe I'm looking out and I'm seeing Josh and Eli, and it's their adoption. Is it, is it your adoption day today? The 28th. The 28th. Can we give it up for the Santiago's? We get adoption happening all over this place. It's awesome. You know why? Because the gospel is real here. Yes. And adoption is the gospel story we told the flesh. Yes. Like you didn't have a family, and now at great expense to another family, we chose to make you family and not get in here because we're just going to love the heck out of you. That's, that's the gospel. And that's also adoption. That's why you see it over and over and over again. We're going to make you sons and daughters where you were orphans. Because we can and we want to. Because we desire to. 
Just like the Father, I desire this. And so, so the first, I quit, how do we, how do we begin to, so, so, here's what I tell my kids in the morning, I say like, I love you, um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of you, and I believe in God's spirit in you. And so, because I don't really believe in my kids, that you shouldn't believe in me either. You can absolutely believe in the living Jesus in me and like what he can do in and through me, but like my potential is like, horrific outside of Jesus but because Jesus lives in me then you can have confidence in what God is doing in me and so I just I'm just trying to create a culture maybe that's weird to you and it doesn't connect but we just try to let our kids know on, as much as we can on a regular basis man I believe in God's spirit in you and so for for the young ones who have not made any kind of profession of faith you know like they're two so we're it's like, you know, we got another year. We're going to make that happen. Just kidding. But there's, so I believe in God's spirit for you. I believe in God's spirit for you. I believe in God's spirit in you. And then we're able to talk about, dude, you have crazy potential, Caroline, to be this amazing evangelist, even though you don't love talking to a ton of people. Why? Because God's evangelistic spirit lives in you. Cole, you have this amazing opportunity to be the advocate for the weak. Why? Because you're this amazing 12-year-old who does it? Yeah, you do it a little bit. No, but because God's spirit of advocacy lives within you. Yes. And so I'm beginning to see, and as parents, we can begin to see, and as the body of Christ, we can begin to see God's spirit in and for people before it actually becomes a reality and starts speaking that into them, encouraging them to the better part of it. I quit, but people aren't going to realize that fully until they quit on themselves. They're going to keep having this 50-50 this game where it's like some of me and some of God. This is more how it works. I quit, Jesus, on my trying not to be anxious. I'm quitting. You can do so much better, and I'm expecting and asking you to. Yes. Let's move forward together. I quit, you can, let's go. Say it with me. I quit, you, you can, can, let's, let's go. go. One more time. I quit, I quit you, you can, can, let's, let's go. go. That's how the gospel works in us. It's also how the gospel works in those who are far from God. If you're here with an I deserve mentality, it's okay. This is my dad's for you as well. But it's the same invitation for you. And we can see anger, resentment, all those sort of things. That's an I deserve mentality. And, and finally, we see the Father, he's like, man, I desire. I, I want you both. I think sometimes in my preaching and in my believing, I think the Father wants the younger son more than he wants the older son. That's wrong. It's bad theology. But I believe that sometimes. I believe that sometimes the father is, is he, he would rather see the younger son come home than the older son leave the working fields and come in. But it's not true. You have to understand that the father has this deep, radical, reckless desire for both, no matter who you might be. So it's okay to identify yourself with the older because older brothers and older sisters don't like to identify themselves. The younger brother and the younger sister are like, yeah, dude, I'm broken. I'm already, you're talking about that? That dad's for me? I'm in. That's one of the main reasons this church was started because we came to Delray and we found a whole crew of people who were like, of course I'm broken. You got grace for me through Jesus Christ? Give me some of that. But there's a ton of older brothers and older sisters over here who are afraid to identify and complain with where they are and who they are. And so they remain out in the field. But I'm here to tell you the Father desires you both and it's safe. Yes. And it's actually a better party. And until you understand that, then you're not going to have any kind of evangelical spirit for somebody else because you're not at the better party and you wouldn't invite somebody to slay them in the fields, now would you? You'd probably protect them from that. So where do we go from here? Well, man, there's one better party at the center of the story. I think we can see that. Um, and so as we, as we begin to look at, like, what does this mean for us? Um, culturally and even individually, some practical stuff. First of all, it's one of the main reasons why we're, we're attempting to, to like throw the better party all over the Avenue Church. Sunday mornings, out in the lot. We brought cold brew in today. That's a special kind of like cool iced coffee. If you're not into coffee, that's okay. But like if you are, you know that the better party has come. We're just trying to elevate your experience here at the Avenue Church, both here, both in Ave Kids, in your parking. We got parking now for young families. Listen, that stuff doesn't just happen. 
Like we're trying to throw the better party because we believe that the Father is at the center of the better party and it honors and glorifies Him when we put on this beautiful experience because that is accurate to the heart of the Father. We're looking at ways, how do we throw the better party all over this church? And the question for us as we reimagine evangelism is how do you begin to throw the better party all over your life? So that it looks like the Father is there because He really is through Christ. Reimagining evangelism is all about an invitation to the better party. So if that's true, let's just kind of finish up with some practical thoughts on that. First, my dad's there. You have to understand that at the better party, my dad's there. It's not just a party to a good time. It's not just like, hey, we just want to like, like do things in excellence so that we can feel good about ourselves. No. Always at the better, because the world can throw an excellent party, right? Always at the better party, our Father is there. He's always the center of the better party. He's always the motivation for why we're living as though we belong to the better party. And so uh, my dad is there. I've already told you a little bit about my dad. And so as we re use the word reimagine, here, and you'll see it on your outline, this is where we reimagine happiness. Stay with me for a second. We reimagine happiness. This is where we, we begin to understand both the younger son and the older son were looking for the same thing. They were looking for life. They were looking for happiness. One guy looked for it by breaking all the rules. The other guy looked for it by keeping all the rules. Both of them missed happiness. Both of them missed life. Both of them missed the Father. So as you start to think about evangelism, I want you to reimagine happiness as a beautiful evangelistic tool because that's what your lost friends are looking for. They're looking for life. They're looking for happiness. And we get the opportunity to enter into their world and begin to talk to them about how's that working out? What does that look like for you? Would you ever be open to something different and potentially better? Because my dad's over here. I don't think where you are is really where you want to be. From what I heard, John did a fantastic job last week explaining that to us in detail. Thank you for him. Secondly, come as you are. Come here. Yay, John. Come as you are. This might be one of my favorite things to say here. Come as you are. You get changed there. Yes. Just... Wouldn't it be cool if we could just start inviting people to come as they are and let God do the change? Yeah. And not think that we have to like reform their lives along the way. If that were the case, then we'd have to reimagine a relationship. We'd have to reimagine what it looks like to hang out with some tax collectors and sinners. And engage them where they are in an invitation to the better party, not in moral reform. Right where we need it. Does God want to change people? Of course. Look at you. Are you who you were a year ago? No. You're not even who you were a week ago. God loves us too much to leave us where He found us, but He loves us enough to go to where we are. How cool is it in your evangelical thoughts to be able to invite people to come as they are because they get changed at the party? That's where the younger son got changed, right? The robe, the rain. It all happened with the father at the party. Thirdly, it's catered. I love this. The party's catered. It's got even more than cold brew. Did you know that every feast in the Old and New Testament, I was talking to a church friend, a friend of mine, and he was like, man, I'm not sure we should spend this. People were asking me, like, are, man, I don't know, like, are tithe dollars going to this feast? He was celebrating his volunteers. They went to Buca de Beppo. And, and they, they were like, eh, feasting. And some of them were like, eh, I don't know. Eh, should I? Because it's, the, it's God's money. And I was just like, bro, just find me the feast where God skips in the scripture. Find it for me in the Old Testament. I look at Isaiah. I look at a couple places. I just see like extravagant feast. And then finding the place in the New Testament, Luke 15, Book of Revelation. How about the feast that we're about to celebrate? Does he, does he skimp on the death and resurrection of his son? I mean, these are feasts of extravagance. Why? Because it highlights the center of the feast, God himself. So understanding that it's catered, here's what I want you to do. I want you to reimagine as we think about this, um, this idea is like, man, it's this, it's this great party, 
I want you to reimagine invitation. Reimagine invitation so you know it's, you know that your dad's there, you know it's a feast, you know all these wonderful things about it, you know it gets better over there. Start, do some practical stuff. Reimagine justice. Reimagine what it means to maybe, uh, because here's the deal, I'm, I'm trying to get you to the party, I'm trying to get you to the feast, I'm not the center of the feast, but I know where it is, and I'm just going to walk alongside of you as the Holy Spirit does his thing and his timing, and here's some practical things, like, so if I'm thinking about invitation to the feast, here's a time to reimagine invitation, reimagine justice. There are many of your lost friends who are going to come to the City House Soiree Gala coming up in April before they're going to come to a church service. There are many of your friends that are going to volunteer at Foster Parent Night Out once a month on a Friday night to help foster kids before they're going to come hear this guy preach at them. There are a ton of justice initiatives, and there are some that we're actually specifically in, like doing. Man, what an awesome opportunity to be evangelistic. Think justice. Think people want to be involved with something greater than themselves. That very much is not only the picture of the gospel, but also part of the process to many people coming to the gospel. Think invite differently. Think about your work differently, man. Monday through Friday, if you're just a hazard this week, if you're just a happy worker, you know you're in the like an elite category. Like everybody's working for Friday, but what if you show up and you're like, dude, I can't wait for Monday because I'm going to get after it and I'm going to do something that's awesome, whether it's flipping burgers or teaching kids, it doesn't matter. What if your work became a place where you brought the better party and people were like, what is up with this guy? Yes, yes. Why is this woman so awesome and happy at what she does? <laughs> I think you should rethink your... Freedom from addiction, those of you who are clean. I had somebody celebrate 10 months today. I had somebody just recently, three years. You know, you're, you're freedom from Yeah, let's give it up for that. You know, your freedom from addiction is not about you, right? I mean, it's cool that you're enjoying it and the Father loves you, so there is a piece that is definitely about you. But let's start thinking about. What about evangelism? What about the lost? Let's think about inviting people to your story of freedom and the God who brought you to the better place. And you tell that in such a way that honors the Father, not you. Let's reimagine evangelism. So here's where we end. Prepare our hearts for communion. My dad loves. So there's something my dad loves. And, and it's been kind of new to me. I don't know why it's new. Like, I, I'm going to be careful here because I'm still learning about this. Like, my dad loves when I spend time with him. My dad loves when I pray and I'm faithful and I, I, you know, I look away when I want to look. Whether that's with another person or it's another church or whatever. But I'm like faithful in my eyes and my heart. So, so like my dad loves that stuff. But you know, like there's something my dad like super loves. And I don't know why I haven't caught this earlier. But he loves when other new people get brought to the party. He's like super into that, man. And I'm super into my dad. So I don't know how I've missed so long that I would want to be a part of something that like radically makes my father's heart celebrate. Other than pursuing lost people and inviting them to the party. My dad loves when other people come to the party. And so I'd like for you to reimagine that. I'd like for you to reimagine our father as one who is extravagantly ready to celebrate not only when people come to the party but when somebody like you and me actually faithfully bring them. I'm going to end with a problem and then we're going to celebrate communion that reminds us why it's no longer a problem. As I was journaling this week in the K part, I do the walk journal, word, application, or pay attention, life, how it applies to my life, and the K is a prayer right now. And I finished this and I was like, God, I got it. Like, you're super into that. There's only one problem, and it's me. 
And here's what I wrote verbatim. Jesus, I cannot do this. This whole evangelism thing, I just can't do it. I get afraid, distracted, ashamed, and fatigued. I cannot live like this. I'm too selfish and consumed and fearful. But you, you and me, you in me, you are my hope. So please, with all that I have, I am asking you to be this and do this in me. I surrender my life to you. I expect you. I am confident in you. I am happy in you. Thank you as you do it. I love you. So I'm believing this to be true for all of us. That Jesus in us, the great evangelist, will help us as we go. Amen? Amen. As we come to the feast that he left us, the better party, this is us saying, I quit. You came. Let's go. And so for those of you who have made that decision to quit on yourselves and repentance and faith is the biblical words for that, come to Jesus and trust him as your Savior and Lord. This is a time for us to be nourished and refreshed. I'm going to ask our elders to come down and we'll serve and if you're not a believer, maybe just listen to the music and let the, kind of some of the words of the song pour over you. Meditate on what it means to quit and let Jesus begin. If you're a believer here and you find yourself either as the younger brother or the older brother, and that's been a pattern in your life, the Lord very clearly revealed to me I've got a lot of older brother left in me. But then you know what else I know? He still desires me. He still wants to work in me, and I'm ready for that. If you find yourself in some sort of like sin pattern and, and you're ready to get right and bring that to quit on that and begin again with Jesus, you should come. But if you're here and you're not ready to quit when God's called you to quit, then like just be where you are and allow God's spirit to bring a softness that you don't have. I'm going to invite all of us tonight to pray to come and quit on ourselves tangibly. Take the better part of Go back to our seats and we'll all take it together. Let the words wash over you in this song. Father, we quit because we know that you are the better party. We trust you. We choose you by faith. We come to you in great expectation. We desire to bring others along. Let's go. Amen. Amen.